Right, so it's not yet 12, John. So we'll give people a uh, give people a few minutes. Well, a couple, sure. I say a few. We've got loads to get through, so we'll give them like a minute. Wait till wait till one minute past 12. Yeah, we need to reward the people who came, came here on time. That's the thing. <laughs> I think we should. I'm, 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 I'm looking at the uh, the list. I see some new people. I see some some regular regular visitors. I'm seeing I'm seeing people from Thailand. I'm seeing US. Okay. Yeah, we'll give them give them till one minute past, and then hopefully we can cram. Hopefully we can get all of that knowledge out of your head and dispel, <laughs> dispel some of these these myths. So what, yeah, what, I'm make them what, what are you using, by the way? I'm, I'm, I'm a little jealous. Uh, this is a something something Logitech. It's a fairly generic one, but I'm using a piece of software called XSplit, which I think I had to pay like $20 or something for. And it does intelligent background removal, so I can do this, I can put stuff behind. There's a whole bunch of stuff that does this, but I found the blurring on this one does less of the um, kind of weird pixelation that a lot of them do, and I can control the, the level quite easily, which is quite nice. Yeah, so I'm just I'm... do a subtle depth of field behind me, just enough to keep the texture but lose the detail. It's really yeah, I'm nice. Gonna, I'm going to check that out this afternoon. But uh, right, I think um, you know we got to, we're a minute past, so uh, so let's let's get the ball rolling. Um, so thanks for tuning in, guys. Um, I think this yeah. is the fourth or fifth working from home webinar and today as you can see from the title uh, the title is boosting your presence in SERP features with schema markup and what we didn't want to do today was just start bursting out and talking about json lb and code and stuff like that yeah you know, we want to try and simplify things we want to dispel some myths we want to go through you know what schema is you know let's get rid of some of that confusion what are the benefits what's the connection with with featured snippets the what's the impact on the SERP landscape what's the best way of implementing it what mistakes and we were talking about mistakes earlier um, mm. and of course what does the future hold and at the end you know my my, my guest speaker who i'm just about to introduce now um, is going to take us through some of his top tips and i could not think of a better person to bring on to talk about this subject than the you know i've got to say the one and only john o <laughs> thank you very much please introduce it's a pleasure to be here okay yeah. um so yeah very briefly in a nutshell um once upon a time i started that as a bedroom web developer writing code and building websites for small businesses um but realized that the most interesting bit of that by far was the seo side and the how do you make this work and the technical side in particular so should i use this tag or that tag and which one's better and all the nuance of that i find is really interesting um, so since then, obviously, come on a little bit, um, and I've worked at um, some really big agencies. I've worked at Distilled, which some of you will have heard of. Um, I was at Linkdex for a while, who were one of the big data vendors, and in fact, a, a competitor, but not really a very good one for Pi in some ways. Um, so yeah, that was really fun. And I more recently um, at Yoast, which hopefully everyone's heard of, um, best known for our WordPress SEO plugin that runs on something like 11 million websites now, which is pretty awesome. And I handle a lot of our research and development, product pipelining, um, as well as doing things like this and engaging with the SEO community and making sure that we um, we know what we're doing. So that's that's pretty fun. It's a bit chaotic. Well, fantastic. And I, I'm sure anybody who knows anything about SEO will have heard will have heard you. And certainly, you know, I've seen you talk on many occasions, and uh, I know this is a subject you're super passionate about. Um, so. I was going to say at the end of this, guys, uh, Jono and I are going to be on Slack for say 30 minutes or so to answer any of your perhaps more detailed or more technical questions. Um, and but also as we go through, if you do have any questions, just drop them into the uh, chat, which um, is is down there or there or however you got your your screen configured. So let's let's begin with some simplification and demystif demystification schema markup. Schema.org, structured data, people use these interchangeably. Jono, can you really simplify things for us? Sure. So, yeah, this is an absolute mess. And even Google's documentation in places doesn't do a great job of picking out which one they're actually talking about. So it's and, and the terms themselves are a bit messy. So let's try and let's try and take that apart. Structured data is where we're going to start, which is just the idea that if you have something like an address on a page or a recipe, 
As humans, it's really easy for us to pass that. When we see it, we understand that the first line of address is the house number, the second line is the street, et cetera. For machines, that's a little bit harder. There's a lot of differences and presentations vary. So structured data is um, a way of explicitly describing that so that systems can understand it as well as humans. And there are a hundred ways you can do that and a hundred languages and techniques. Schema.markup is one of those. And it is increasingly the most prevalent and most impactful way. So you want to describe your address in a way that a system can understand in structured data, you do that using schema markup. Schema.org, and this is where it gets really confusing, is both the website which houses the schema.org standard and the standard itself. So schema.org is a way of doing schema markup, which is a form of structured data, which I'm sure hasn't cleaned it up at all, but um, we'll see if, that, um, see if that makes sense and we'll try and try and dig in some specifics as we go through. It, it certainly helps make sense. And, you know, so, and, and, and you know, it, it's the vocabulary, isn't it? Uh, schema.org. Yes, absolutely. The, 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 okay, wonderful. Um, right. Let me just locate my mouse on my screens. Bear with me. Too many screens, too many mice. Now, when people talk about schema, the one thing that they always say, and I thought I'd get this out there at the front, you know, what's it good for? Uh, it's good for structuring your data and it's good for featured snippets. Um, and here's just an example of a feature snippet. <laughs> why, what, why is the sky blue? And and I don't know whether it was, you know, whether I heard you talking about this. It probably was you, that, that quote there. Google wants to serve more answers more quickly to more people than ever before. You know, is, does, that, does that resonate with you? Yeah, and I think it's something we're going to come on to. But really, the, the, the current experience we have with search, where you type something into a box and get a list of links, isn't really what they want to be aiming for. That's, that's short term and that's yesterday's model. Really, this is the objective that they want to give people answers. And in order to do that, schema is going to play a big part. Yeah, absolutely. And at the bottom there, you know, there's, there's that um, uh, quote, 12.29% uh, of search queries result in a featured snippet. And that came from an Ahrefs study, which looked at several million results. And I think, you know, almost 13 percent, that's a sizable chunk of real estate. And then what we'll do in a bit, we'll get in and take a close look at that and see what it see what it really means. Now, yeah. Google's vision of the future. This is something I know you spend a lot of your time thinking about. <laughs> I heard yep. you talk about this. So, you know, tell us what is that vision of the future, a search engine or something different? Sure. So I think we just started to touch on it. And it's this idea that and, and this is they've said as much literally um, in, in some of their meetings and their announcements that their vision has always been that they want to be what they refer to as the Star Trek computer, where you just ask it a question and it magically solves it. And it understands enough about the context and the local environment and your personality and your history and your preferences just to get it right. And that's really where they want to get to. They don't want to be a search engine that indexes the web. They want to be something much closer to a personal assistant. And yeah, the, today's model of you search and you get a list of links that you, you have to pick through is a failure of them to reach that goal. And they feel that deeply. They really want to get to the point where you don't have to pick and choose and think as a user. They just magically solve your problems. Wouldn't wouldn't that be nice? I, you know, I oh, share that with you. You know, and part of me scared about it, part of me is worried, but part of me really wants that personal system because let's face it, search can be painful. Rooting through those results can be painful. So this takes us on to this. And this is again, this is one of one of your quotes. Um, structured data, it's an arms race. Oh yeah. Tell us yeah, it really is. This. Sure. So I'm in my role at Yoast, I'm looking enough to have some interesting conversations with people from Google and Facebook and Wikipedia and some other places about some of their long term roadmaps and structured data comes up time and time again, every one of those conversations. And it's because that they know in order to become this Star Trek computer, which is what all of these brands want. They don't want to just be services. They want to be in our lives and right at the forefront of the way we interact with things. In order to do that, they have to have more and better structured data for Google. They're Google's the way it works is fundamentally it scrapes the web and then, then it uses and reads that content. And if that content isn't good enough and isn't structured enough, and if they don't understand it, it's really hard to then do that kind of clever problem solving. So in order for them to have your Google Assistant or your microwave or your mobile phone solve your problems for you, they need the content on the web to be better, to be better structured, to be more explicit and to be written in a way that they can understand it. And at the moment, 
they're losing to Amazon in a lot of places. Where Amazon have a very different model where they pay a lot of developers a lot of money to write specific skills. Google are very much limited just by scraping the internet and the content out there. So they're really keen on incentivizing webmasters to start to use this sort of stuff. Awesome. And, and, and you think that's why uh, Google made the announcement that they recently made about shopping, um, just so they could get, be, become a little bit more like Amazon? Yeah, absolutely. So Google are winning on information and on problem solving and on queries, and Amazon are winning on retail. And obviously, both of them want to get into the other side of the, slice of the pie. So it's going to be really interesting to see where that goes. Definitely keeping a close eye on that one. So, you know, I, I think it's fair to say that Google is making some really good progress in its direction to become our, you know, this, this personal assistant. You know, we have these wonderful answer cards here. Um, this one I particularly like, you've got this image carousel, which takes some of the images from a page that looked like it was uh, created in about um, 1998. <laughs> it does, doesn't it? You know, it, it's interspersed with some other images. Um, you know, beautiful answer card if you like, because they know that Google has a cutoff whether it's, uh, I think it's eight for bulleted lists, I think it's nine for tables, they'd extended theirs out. I'd say it was an accident, but you know, an example of good progress, have you seen any better examples? What are, what are your thoughts? So I think this is this is their first step, and we, not so long ago, these were new and exciting and different. I think these have become really normal now, and as we search for pretty much anything, you'll see these kind of results where they think they've picked the best one, and they pull out and feature it in a bit more depth. But you can see there's still some limitations here. It's definitely better than me having to look at all 10 of those links on the results page and pick one and think about it and evaluate it. But it's still not great. Essentially, all it's doing is scraping and reproducing bits of content on that page. It's, it's an expanded advert that helps me be sure that this is the page I'm looking for. But I've still got to read it. I've still got to think. And I've still got to click through and visit it. This isn't the answer engine they want to get to, but it's a good first step. You're right. You've still got to go through some pain. It's still a hassle. OK, um, here, here, are, here are some more examples. Again, um, growth in interaction. I, I love the avocado one. I think it was one of the, the very first one that I, I got really excited about. Um, they've, they, they've changed over the years. You used to be able to see um, does an avocado from California have more calories than one from Las Vegas, for, for example, or somewhere else. Um, so, and then we've got you know, Celsius, hotels, broadband speed test. Um, you know, good examples of interaction. How far, how long do you think, how far away are we from this becoming the vision that you're, you know, that you believe is going to happen? I think we're really close. I think even, so they're, they're still limited by schema adoption in some places, though, my gosh, they're working to fix that. So an entirely separate conversation, but it won't surprise you that Google are investing heavily in big areas of WordPress. We've talked about this, which is a third of the web, because they know that to win this arms race, they need to be really investing deep in the infrastructure. So I think they recognize that there's a big challenge to do, but I don't think they're that far off. This sort of stuff becomes really easy for them. They have the scale and the machine learning capabilities to understand there are a billion websites that mention avocados and 99% of them are consistent on things like the calorie count. They can just extract that and use it. But it's this next level they really want to get to where people can take action in the search engine results. They can understand, they can interact, they can compare multiple complex things. And they're not quite there yet and they need us to get there. And there's an interesting power dynamic there. Yeah, they need us. And I think we're going to come on to that in a little bit. You know, what can we do to help Google deliver the vision um, of, of, of the future? So, you know, the, the, the SERP landscape, and, and, and we were talking about this yesterday, you know, schema markup is helping, you know, that structured data create a richer, much more interactive landscape. And, you know, for those, anybody on the call who hasn't seen this is a SERP matrix view from Pi. We're looking at the top results day by day. We can see People also ask answer cards. Um, uh, what else have we got? We got video carousels. We got classic links. Now, Ahrefs did a did a Ahrefs did a study recently, and I really like that one. I think we're going to put a note to that in the comments. And they said that when there's a a featured snippet in first position, it only gets 8.6% of the clicks, while the page actually below it gets 19.6. Uh, percent, mm. And that's compared to an absence of feature snippets or ads when the top one gets 26 percent. Um, you know, these feature snippets, they're there whether we love them or whether we hate them. But we have to embrace them, don't you think? Yeah. And these are very much going to become the norm. This isn't a case where Google are 
are just putting three or four things in the top of the search results. It's an ongoing transformation away from lists of links towards things. And I, I'm just going to link to a study that I saw recently from um, Systrix, a rank tracking platform. Um, but they, they'd identified 40 different types of these rich results, varying from weather cards to hot dog cards to car, like whatever they are. And they're, they're only going to get more. And these are going to get more and more common. So this is very much the time when we need to stop thinking about lists of links and where I rank my link is and start thinking about the search engine result as a a soup of different types of opportunities, yeah. whether that's different media types or different content types or for different people in different stages of the buying cycle. And do we have the content and the formats and the messaging for them? Absolutely, Jono. Yeah. Stop getting obsessed with my position, you know, my, my visibility, but, you know, in what format is my content surfacing? And Google talks about about surfaces. Um, you know, and, mm. and, and, and when I look at that matrix view, you know, you know what I see? I see value. I see opportunity. For most of all, I see the majority of people just kind of ignoring, ignoring that rich layer that we have. Um, I don't know not not thinking about you know uh, or certainly not making the most of that opportunity and talking of opportunity you know nothing spells it out to me more than a slide like this and I'll tell you what we're looking at this is a revenue opportunity charts um, within the UK fragrances sector I'm not going to mention who this is but this is a very big player in that market and we're looking at two of those matrix views one with features and one without so the beginning without okay now without by ignoring features you actually underperform on a revenue opportunity perspective by 70 percent that blue bar shows the amount of revenue in a week that company is making now the little pink bit that actually shows the opportunity that's uh close performing content is sitting on pages two and three so when you look below with features okay so with features Overall, you actually perform 50% better from a revenue opportunity perspective. These aren't just features. These aren't just adornments, but these are doorways into your world. These are doorways that you can either open or shut. Mm. And it's all. I mean, does that, does that figure surprise you, John? It, it, no, precisely because of what you say, that people tend to ignore these. They'll think... Um, oh, there's a lot of video results in these search engine results pages. We can't compete there. Rather than thinking, okay, maybe we need to invest in video because this isn't just about a, a diminishing space that we can play in. It's about an opening up, as you say, of new formats and new types. And maybe some of those are going to be harder than others. Maybe video is not maybe video is not easy for you for a number of reasons, but it's an example of somewhere you're going to have to choose to play or not. Yeah, and, 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 and there's nothing you know, that can help you choose better than analysis of the SERP landscape. And that's why it's so important that we use all this data and stay close to the SERP. Because in by staying close to the SERP, you're staying close to your customer. And you know, never has there been a time um, that I can remember where we have to stay as close to our customers as possible. Because as, as I always say, you know, the SERP um, you know, is the biggest sort of uh, or the easiest way of getting inside the mind of the customer. It's a reflection of search or intent. So what we've done with this UK fragrances market, we've ranked ranked it by the, here we've got the top 12, uh, the top 12 players. On the left, we've got features not included. So we're just, we're looking at results and we're forgetting about all those features. On the right, we're looking at the results and we're including the features. There are huge changes mm. in position, which means you're either gonna make more money or, or, you, or you're gonna throw it away. Elements.com, you know, without features, they don't do brilliantly, you know, they're in what ninth position, but as soon as you include features, their position jumps up, suggesting somehow they are making the most of that opportunity. Others drop. And there are some really, really big movements. And in fact, guys, if you've got access to the um, leaderboards, then you can see some of this sort of data within those leaderboards. OK, so again, huge differences. No surprise, eh, Jono? No, and where you see this really happening is when people have really joined up strategies. So things like that difference might be because they are really strong on Twitter and Google is exposing their tweets in the search results, which then pushes everyone else down. Or it might be that they do a really great job of help content at the top of the funnel or even after purchase. And that's answering people's queries so that they're not getting further into the, the, the cycle. I mean, yeah, this is this works well when you when you've got all your ducks in a row.
Yeah, getting your ducks in a row. And again, something I always like, you know, I say to I'm sick, sick in the place, the better we get at making the right connections between our different assets and linking things together, the better Google will understand the relationship and the better our performance and visibility will be. Okay, so now big question here, big question, John. Features aside, because we know they are a big benefit or upside, what are the other benefits of adding structure or structured data? So we're going to come on to this, I think, in a bit more depth, but there's an interesting, there's a, there's a shift in the way we think about marketing that needs to occur, which is that throughout all of history, all of advertising and marketing has been based on getting into a conversation with your audience, whether that's in physically or in not, getting them to your site, and then convincing them that you're a good fit, telling them your story, giving them your pitch. What's happening now is that Google, Amazon, Facebook, etc., are sitting in front of that process, and you can't yeah. convince them. You have to prove to them that you're a good fit. Otherwise, you never get the opportunity to have that conversation with the customer. So now, th this isn't just a way to unlock features in search results. It's the table stakes for accessing the market. Because if Google and Facebook and so on can't understand that you might be a good potential candidate for a consideration set, then you don't get into that set. So it's not even a feature versus cost and opportunity yeah. analysis. That if you want to get to your market, then this is, this is table stakes. It seems so obvious when you put it like that. And I really hope that people who are listening are now thinking, actually, this is something I need to actually uh, take a little bit more seriously. So now this, I, you know, I, I stole this from one of, one of your uh, presentations, I believe. I think it originally came from Ahrefs. My, yes. my question to you, Jono, um, you know, what, firstly, what's the intent behind these types of query, the 12 most frequent words used? And what's the relationship between those keywords um, and schema? I love this. So this is where people start. This is, I have a problem, whether it's with my dishwasher or not knowing what car to buy or any number of other things. This is where people start searching. It's so common for us to get caught in this mindset that people go to Google, put our keyword in and visit our site. That's not how people behave. They do 10 searches over five days on three devices and they'll start here with questions why I'm not even sure what the question is. How do I versus compare the things? This is where people begin. And then if I'm the kind of site that has used schema and rich snippets and uh, use schema and uh, structured data to have articles and guides and support, then Google is going to expose those in the search results. And then everything that happens next, I've got brand recognition, I've got familiarity, I've got preference. If you're not there, then maybe those consumers never bump into your brands because they've already made a connection with your competitors. So yeah, you want to, yes, you want to convert people and you want to sell to them at the end of their journey, but you've got to be present at the beginning, otherwise they might never see you later on. 100%, yeah, be there every step of that purchase journey. And to do that, you need to understand the intent. Um, okay, uh, eat. Okay, now it's you that put this, this seed in my mind about the connection between uh, schema markup and eat. And what I've got here are uh, four images, four uh, rich snippets from YM, YMYL content. Okay, we've got uh, stuff about uh, medicine, taking your temperature, doing deadlifts, which I guarantee if you do those wrong, you're going to end up in a lot of trouble. <laughs> investing as well. So Jono, tell us a little bit more about that relationship. Sure, so we know that Google has this mental model of expertise, authority, and trust. And it, it's an abstraction and a simplification of the bigger picture, but it's quite a nice way of thinking about it. Now, if your pages have authorship schema, where you describe the name of the person who wrote it and reference their Twitter account and say that they won these two awards and went to this university and have this biography and are six foot four, et cetera, et cetera, then suddenly that's a lot more explicitly trustworthy than otherwise. Um, and you're including that on the page so the users see it as well. And similarly, if you um, describe your organization and you say this has a physical address, this has a telephone number, it has a support contact you can email, it was established in this year, and all this rich metadata, you become more authoritative and more trustworthy and you start to um, validate the fact that your content is, is reputable. And we know that if we're moving to this world where Google is extracting content from people's pages and showing it to users in the search engines, search results, it's only going to do that with content from sources that it deems are trustworthy. So this is going to be a big, even if they're not using it explicitly, it will correlate so well with the experience that users have of those pages that they may as well be. It's going to be critical to demonstrate that you're trustworthy and yeah, marking up your content and with all those details is going to be a big part of that. 
So if you are an expert, you are an authority, you are trustworthy, then you'd be crazy not to use schema to help Google understand that. Yep. Cool. Now, okay. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. Everybody asks this. Um, you know, we need to invest in, 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 in schema. We need to structure our data. And the response is often, yeah, but is it going to bring us money? Is it going to increase our visibility? And I've got a quote here or several quotes from John Muller. Okay. None other. Okay. Then John Muller. What do you say? Yeah. Schema readies content to be found across different surfaces and moments. We can better understand the ent entities on a page. It helps us understand and match intent. Now, you could actually swap the word schema mm -hmm. with something like good site structure, architecture, and SEO. And this is, is then the advice that we were given, you know, 10 years ago. Do you think, what, what are your thoughts on this? Does it help? Yeah, absolutely. Even if it's only directly, I'm just linked to another quote, which I think is brilliant. Um, it's from some of the help documentation around schema. And they say that providing schema markup helps them by providing explicit clues about the meaning of a page and wait for it, that that helps them to understand the content of the page as well as to gather information about the world and the web in general. That's huge. That's, that's where they want to get to. They don't want to be crawling pages and trying to guess what your content's about. They really want to understand all those connections so they can use that to decide what to show when. And even though there's work involved in doing this and some complexity setting it up, it's worth thinking if any of your competitors do it and you don't, Google is going to understand them better and be able to match that intent better and get their consumers to them. So there's a, there's a real challenge of the, we really all have to play this game and to feed them this information. Yeah, well, I think that's pretty conclusive. You believe it's the case. I believe it's the case. You know, John Muller, even though he doesn't actually say it, he certainly believes it's the case. It'd be mad not to include it. Now, conscious that um, time, time is always against us, always. But uh, in, 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 in 30 seconds or 60 seconds, Jono, what's the best way of implementing it? So the best, <laughs> if you're running WordPress like a clever person, then installing the Yoast SEO plugin is a great foundation. We do a lot of it out of the box, but obviously a lot of people aren't. Um, so there's a really good platform called schemaapp.com, which is the next best thing. Um, and failing that, and I'll come on to it in a minute, I would recommend avoiding too much DIY. It's very easy to get this wrong and to break it, and that can be more harm than good. So whatever system and platform you're on, look for a good foundation. Um, always implement in JSON-LD, which is a particular format that a lot of the guides you'll read will use. It's pretty straightforward. Um, as a mental model, we need to stop thinking about pages and rankings and links, but start thinking about entities and things. I have a product that has reviews, that have authors, that have Twitter profiles. Start looking at a lower level than pages. Um, like you might have a page about a book that's a product, but if you haven't proven that the author is an expert and connected all those reviews together, Google's not going to be able to understand that. So really dissect those pages and that content. Really think about what are all the smaller than page pieces of this that I can describe. And then have a look, and I will share some links, but there are the schema markup and approaches and documented standards for all of these types of things. And, and there's no need to be scared about JSON-LD then. No, it's just um, very, very simple, just text, and you just, just say a cat is a type of animal, and that, it, it's really straightforward. Fantastic. That's, that, that, that is good to hear. Okay, so, and again, you know, we haven't got a huge amount of time left. Um, wh wh where is it all going in, in 20 seconds? Uh, so we, I think we've covered this, um, the few, where, where we're no longer yeah. just marketing to users, but we're having to convince Google that we deserve to market to users before we're allowed to. And part of the way that we do that is we mark up all our things so they can understand them. Wonderful. So finally, Jono, uh, 60 seconds to take us through, your as an expert, your top tips for getting it right. Top tips on schema. So build on a strong foundation. I, I've mentioned Yoast, I've mentioned Schema app. If you absolutely have to, you can do some DIY either manually or through something like Google Tag Manager in JavaScript, but these approaches are really brittle. I would build on a strong foundation. Um, I would go and have a look through Google's documentation. It's surprisingly well-written and accessible. Um, I've, there's a link in there to the product schema example. There's 100 others. And you can start to think, oh, OK, we have image carousels. We have recipes. There are opportunities here to take advantage of these formats. Um, and then you go back and you do the hard work and you implement the schema markup for all of the things that you have that will give you rich results. That's your immediate quick wins. Then you start to get clever. You go, OK, 
We know that Google supports videos from the example earlier, but we don't have any videos of our recipes. Maybe if we add videos to our recipes, we can double up on the impact. So you can go hunting for opportunities. Maybe we should find out where our authors went to university and what awards our people have won, and we should include that on their pages and their schema. Um, there are huge opportunities that nobody takes advantage of around organization markup. So you can have, here's its address, here's the parent organization, here's when it was founded, here's the founder, here's their Twitter account. And um, people as well, um, brother of, height, weight, maybe not a great one to use, but things like alumni of, and is related to, and has Twitter profile, all of these things you can describe really easily. Um, when you're doing all of this, keep your front end of your site and your pages in sync with the schema. You can't have something in schema and not on the page and vice versa. This is all about keeping those in line, putting the stuff on the page and describing it. And then lastly, if you want to get really ahead of your competitors and even Google, go to pending.schema.org. You can see what's in schema.org's pipeline of stuff they're going to release. And at a very quick glance, you can see, for example, in the last few months, they've added a lot of schema to do with properties and rental and healthcare. And it wouldn't be a huge guess to get um, to think that maybe Google is going to make a move on the property market in the next few months. And you maybe ought to consider the impact on your strategy. So go and maybe get ahead in there as well. Very exciting. Fantastic stuff. Fascinating. I love that last one as well. Um, John, I think we're we're out of time as, as always. Thank you. thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate oh, the treat. And, uh, and, and, and thanks to everybody who tuned in to watch. Uh, Jono and I will be uh, on Slack for the next 30 minutes or so if you do have any further questions. So until then, um, don't forget. Oh, yeah, that's, that's my Slack. Um, yeah, thanks again. See you next Friday, same time, same place. Cheers, Jono. Thank you. Bye-bye.